I apologize for wearing the coat and tie. I always feel like, yeah, man, you're the elementary school principal or something when you're dressed up like this. But I just came from a, uh, from a luncheon and uh, jetted over here. And I'm going to go, no, I can't because the mic's tied to it. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and just say, <clears throat> for the next two and a half days, and I say two and a half because on the fifth day, fifth day, <laughs> the fishes and the fowls were made on the third day, uh, we're going to have the next gen preacher search students do part of this presentation. And it won't be this one particularly, but you will be blessed by hearing them. So uh, bring a friend on Friday. Uh, we'll do that. But for the next two and a half or so class sessions, I want to share with you some material that I've been wrestling with, been thinking about, and it is, um, it is still very wet cement, but I was excited enough to say, I, I'd love to get your feedback on it. So I'm going to do a dangerous thing. Preacherwalling at gmail.com. That's my personal email address. Uh, I also have a Pepperdine one, and I read that too. But uh, I, I want to invite you, as you think about the things we're going to talk about, as you read and as you ponder, I'd love to hear what you think. And uh, I promise I won't hold that uh, against you. Uh, in fact, I would, I would invite folks who go, hmm, I don't know about this. Now you say, goodness, Jeff, with an introduction like this, you know, what, what are you going to talk about here? <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm going to talk about the question, what do you do with a broken covenant? What do you do with a covenant that is a pain, that is a problem? Some pains and problems are good things. The Bible speaks about two different kinds of stones. There are foundation stones that the Old Testament says, don't mess with that. The Old Testament tells us that if you mess with a foundation stone, that's an ungodly thing because those stones mark important borders. But then there are stumbling stones. Now, those are the kind you should move. In fact, to leave a stumbling stone in place simply is a way of saying to other people, I don't care. As my wife will sometimes say to me when I put something in the trash and kind of have to, you know, the one under the sink, the all-American trash location, uh, you know, I'll, I'll stick something down there and it's kind of overflowing. So I can just kind of mash it down to get it down in there. And she says, does it ever occur to you <laughs> that there is no trash ferry? <laughs> and that I'm glad you pushed it down so it didn't flow out, but would you think about taking it out? That was our first year of marriage, and I've taken all the trash in our house out since then. <laughs> That's a lie. I... Uh... <laughs> But I believe I may have been guilty of not really tackling some of the stumbling stones that have become urgent and, quite frankly, frightening. You're probably aware of some of the statistics that have been already quoted at this event a couple of times. Working in the Office of Church Relations and directing the Youth Leadership Initiative, I am buried in this data data about what the next generation is thinking about God, or rather not thinking about God or the church or the Bible. I am not a believer in the stories that, oh, all is lost and the sky is falling, henny penny, look out. I am, however, a believer in some of the surveys that have told us that this is not your mama's teen group. In fact, this isn't even my teen group. When I sit and talk with teenagers about the kind of things they're dealing with, the kind of issues they are facing, the kind of material they are confronted with, and you may think pornography, I'm saying the new atheists, the kind of YouTube channels that all of a sudden become clickbait for them, and they're hearing sophisticated, bright people say, really? Really? You still believe in that? Well, I want to talk today about the part that the broken covenant that we refer to as the Old Testament plays in that. And I want to begin with a word of prayer. So let's do that. God, we are thankful for you, your love, and your word. 
God, I believe in your word. I believe in the way that you inspired it through writers, believers of old, who spoke things that we needed to hear on your behalf. Father, I am thankful that you let their personalities flow into this holy document. I am thankful to get a piece of a vision of who Paul was through his writing, of who John was through his, Matthew, Luke, Peter. But Father, we, we wrestle when we seek to know how to rightly handle the scriptures. And we ask your blessings. And God, I just ask that the good stuff from what I'm about to share will stick. And Father, the rest of it will just fall away like chaff. Thank you for your love. And thank you for bringing a new and better covenant in Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray and all say, Amen. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. And I'm going to read a couple of passages that you are probably pretty familiar with. But before I read them, I need to brag on my mom. Mom's been gone several years now. My father was a minister, served in Downey, in the Downey Church of Christ, and in Redlands, and the Redlands Church of Christ actually helped to, to, to launch that congregation. And so mom was in the big middle of every VBS, Bible class, or youth or children's program. This is before the days of youth ministers. I don't know how we did it, but we managed somehow. It was before the days of children's ministers. At least we didn't have one in our little congregation. And so the ladies of the church there at Downey would work together, sometimes meeting at my mama's house right next to the church, to work on their, wait for it, flannel graph collection. How many flannel graph veterans do we have here in, in the house? All right. Now, this is two kind of questions. How many remember seeing and being in classes with flannel graph? How many remember ever actually using or presenting flannel graph? And do we have anybody here who thinks it's a type of pajama? I'm just, I'm, <laughs> I'm curious. Okay. All right. I sometimes will use that phrase with, uh, with students here on campus who are like, what? What is flannel graph? You know, I've, I've had one ask, oh, yeah, I think I've heard their music. Um, <laughs> I'm serious. I had one ask if it was a type of pajamas. Um, I had one say, is that a thing in like in statistics? You know, a flannel graph somehow that you do. And when I tell them they are incredulous, they did what? They would cut out these pictures on felt, and then they would have a felt board. My mother was a flannel graph ninja. She was a black belt at flannel graph. She could make you believe that Naaman just lost his spots. She would float baby Moses down a flannel graph uh, river with just a gentle move of her hand. And when she swapped out the blind man for the man with his eyes like this, the miracle had happened right there. <laughs> Some of my favorite memories in Sunday school was being raised on these great Old Testament stories that my wife, my wife, my mom, had recreated in flannel graph. Noah and the ark and the way the, the, the little animals were in perspective, so they looked so small leading up to the ark until you put Noah right next to it, and he looks like, you know, Ant-Man when he's blown up, Gigantor there next to the little ark. Or the story of Joseph. Oh, mom had one whole shoebox just dedicated to Joseph because Joseph needed different costumes. Joseph needed the servant kind of boy costume and then the coat of many colors costume. And then he needed his Egyptian prince costume, which, you know, kind of Pharaoh-esque. Uh, in fact, she even swapped out, and I never forget her taking a pen to give him just a little eyeliner when he was the Pharaoh, uh, you know, or the, uh, the right hand of Pharaoh, because she wanted it to be convincing. Sweet memories of flannel graph Naaman and the Battle of Jericho. Now, while mom was a master of the flannel graph, my father was an absolute Old Testament whiz when it came to what I now call the Church of Christ Catechism. On, uh, on Sunday mornings, we would have children's time 
before Bible class started. Now, I'd be curious to know if anybody else had this at, at your congregation. Maybe it was just a thing my dad did. But I remember we would all come and sit in the first two or three pews for about 10 minutes before Bible class began. And my father always started with the same question. Who made the world? Oh, good. Wow. Okay. I... <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to back way up if we don't have that one down. <laughs> so I'm a little curious. This, this, seriously, this is what I was raised on. Who made the world? God. How many days taken to make it? Oh, my God. What did God do on the seventh day? Rested. That's because he was finished on the first six days. On the first day, God created... And the Lord said, let there be. And he divided the light in the darkness he called. <laughs> what are they serving in the cafeteria these days? Not supposed to be any alcohol on the campus. All right. So we would go through these questions and my dad could rattle them off. And then who's the first man God created? What's his wife's name? First baby born in the world. Cain, his brother's name. Third brother. Very good. Fourth brother. No, I am. We don't know, but there had to be one because we're all here is what I always thought, all right? We'd roll on through those and ten generations later the world became so wicked God called a man to build an ark and save him. His name was? And then he told the story of Noah and how Noah and his three sons. All right, Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their three wives. Mrs. Shem, Mrs. Ham, Mrs. Japheth, all along with Noah and his wife got on the ark and God closed the door. And how long did it rain? 40 days and, right, it didn't stop at night. 40 days and 40 nights. And then Noah sent out a bird. First bird he sent out was a raven. That's right. And the raven no, didn't, didn't find anything, didn't come back with any, any leaves and finally sent out a dove. And what did the dove bring back? Olive branch, which told him that the waters were going down. I can remember as a kid walking through these. And I mean, we didn't quit there. He went on to say, God called a man to leave his father and mother and go to a land. God would show me his name was Abraham. His wife's name was Abraham and Sarah had the child. His name, child of promise, name of Isaac, married a woman by the name of Rebecca. Isaac and Rebecca had the first twins read about in the Bible. Their names are Jacob and Esau. Now, Jacob had 12 sons. Second grade, let me tell you, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. Benjamin. Joseph became the right-hand man of Pharaoh. He became Pharaoh's right-hand man when his brothers were sold him into slavery. I'm having to skip stuff. And sure enough, it was Joseph who saves Egypt, saves his people by preparing after the Pharaoh had those dreams. Remember the dreams? Woke up that morning, was all so upset. That's after he was in the cell with the baker and the uh, cupbearer, and he uh, interpreted their dreams, told the baker, you're going back to service. Told the cupbearer, you're dead in two weeks. And sure enough, he was right with both of them. And when he finally gets up before Pharaoh's, he interprets Pharaoh's dream because Pharaoh had a dream of seven cows that come up out of the river. Seven, what kind of cows? fat cows. And then right behind the fat cows come seven lean, lean skinny cows. And the skinny cows ate the fat cows. But they did not gain any weight. That's the diet I have been looking for. <laughs> All the beef you want and not gain any weight, right? And Joseph, after the corn dream, which is very similar, interprets a dream for him. Pharaoh says, that's it, you're such a wise man. He yanks his brother's chain with a golden cup. But the bottom line is he gets them all up there and they're all in Egypt which we knew meant, uh-oh, dun-dun-dun, because Egypt was not going to go good because there came a new Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. And before you know it, these Israelites who were so fertile, he said, there's so many of them, let's just make them slaves. And the people cried out, and God said, all right, because he watched the harm his people were going through. And when Pharaoh said, we're going to have to trim the population, tell you what, any more boys that are born, kill them. That's stunning for us to hear. It was just an executive order for Pharaoh, boom. And so they went out door to door when they heard that a baby was going to be born. And the people only had a little time to get rid of the child, to hide the child, to try 
because otherwise those boys from Pharaoh would take that child out to the Nile River and throw it in, throw it in and feed the crocodiles. There was a woman named Jochebed who was married to a man named, bonus points, Amram. Yes, you're going to heaven. All right, so <laughs> Jochebed and Amram had a child, and it was a boy. Oh, no, and she said, well, if they're going to throw him in the river, I'll do it for them. And so she made a basket and covered it with pitch and tar so that it would be seaworthy, and she put it in the river, and it slowly floated down to the reeds. I can see this in the flannel graph of my head where a little, a little girl is there. She's wearing a blue kind of toga thing with a little pink kind of sash, and she's peeking through some flannel reeds. You know who that is? That's Miriam, his sister, and she's watching as a lady in a lovely white toga. Thankfully, she bathed in a toga, which I, 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 I you know, she was down there bathing, but mom had a toga on her. Okay. Uh, we discussed that in junior high. Uh, so... <laughs> So she finds him and takes him, and he becomes the Pharaoh's ward. And before you know it, God calls him after he kills a guy and says, I want you to let, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. We'd move from Moses on into the Exodus and on through into the judges. You remember the judges. Let's say them together. <laughs> Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, Gideon, Abimelech, Tola, Jair, Jephthah, Ibsen, Elon, Samson, Eli, and Samuel. Don't you dare be impressed with me. <laughs> no, seriously. I learned those things way before I ever got to fifth grade. Because my mom and dad lived and breathed those stories. And every Sunday... We'd go for 10 minutes and we'd see how far we could go as a group of kids as dad would ask those questions right on. All the way through to King Saul, King Solomon, King David, and then the split in the kingdom, right? Of Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Well, actually, David goes and then Solomon. Of Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And you all know, of course, that it went, you know, Jeroboam, Nadab, Basha, Elah, Zimri. I mean, you, know, you know all those kings. I'm sure you do. <laughs> now, I want you just to take a deep breath. And I need you to know that I have a love-hate relationship with that part of what is called the Bible. Because for me, those were beautiful pictures of a grand history. But today, as I sit down with Pepperdine students, as I talk with high schoolers and junior hires, who, when they are given a Bible, many are, uh, well, I want to be careful what I say here. Uh, there is less biblical knowledge. Now, be careful. I didn't say wisdom, right? There's, there's less time being given, it seems, to kids knowing this book, much less even the books of the Bible. Now, there's some reasons for that that we'll talk about here in a minute. But somebody says... Here's a Bible. Well, they recognize that. That's a book. They know what to do with books. Where do you start? Julie Andrews. Start at the very beginning. Very good place to start. And so students who have never read Scripture have someone who says, I'm a Christ follower. I love Jesus. He's changed my life. I want to introduce you to him. Open up a book and begin reading the section that has become a battleground for faith and a minefield for many in this generation. Because as they begin to read the story of creation, they're also going to a biology class and a cosmology class and a science class. And they keep reading. That's just the first few pages. And within about five pages or six in most Bibles, they get to Noah. Now, when I became a father, we were given a beautiful little Noah mobile that went over our kid's crib. It, it, it's too sweet. It, it had this little tune, and here's a little hanging, uh, it was cloth, so it made me think of flannel graph, a little hanging ark. And then you, you had little animals, you know, hanging around it, and, and it was... 
I just thought it was so cute. Years later, I was describing it to a student, and they said, that's sick. I said, what do you mean? I assume those were all the dead animals floating in the water around the ark, the ones that didn't get on because he could only take a small number, right? Yeah. They said, you know dead bodies float. Yeah. They said, did you have little people on the mobile? People? You know, the thousands and thousands and thousands, I don't know the number who died. Well, 40 days later, it's a great story. Have you ever pondered and imagined without context, without a background, coming across the story of a God who says, drown them all, the babies, the puppies, the deer, the alleg well, I guess the alligator didn't drown because they, they could handle that, but you, you get the picture. You see, I have been confronted with the fact that my flannel graph vision of the Old Testament is something that freshmen, even here at Pepperdine and other Christian colleges, find so challenging. And for some, it leaves them ruined in faith for a time. Now, I want to make sure that you hear me say, I am supportive of our religion classes. I believe everybody needs to learn the Bible. Can we all say, I get that? Second, I believe in the scripture. I believe in the inspiration of the scripture. But I am asking myself the question, am I starting at the right spot? When the first thing a new freshman gets, religion 101. I'm not just saying here at Pepperdine, everywhere. The Old Testament. The broken covenant. The covenant that isn't our covenant. Everybody with me on that? Everybody say, I'm glad that's not our covenant. Yes. Amen. You don't, you don't have to run around with blood on your hands from killing animals. You don't have to go to a temple someplace. You don't have to find a priest. Because that's not our covenant. But it is the place where many who think the Bible is hogwash love to camp. Because without context and without an appropriate interpretation, and sometimes, can I just be honest, even with an appropriate interpretation, there's stuff in the Old Testament that I'm just like, Lord, I don't know if I'd have told that. Um, I think you could have kept that one between you and the angels, you know. I think you could have left that out. Those of you who are Old Testament scholars will know why. I just can't hardly sing the song, Someone's in the Kitchen with Dinah. You'll have to look it up. <laughs> it involves Shechemites and God's people. Now you say, but Jeff, all these things aren't good things. No, 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 they're not good things. But before we walk away from Noah, let's remember Noah didn't cause the flood. Noah didn't suggest that idea to God. Now if that's troubling you, we're heading in a good direction. And I don't want to leave you troubled. And over the next two days, I'm, I'm going to hope to offer some things that will be helpful as you talk to more and more people, young people, I hope. Because if we have the baton of faith, we're in charge of passing that baton on. Amen? Okay, we can't grab their hand and force them to take it. But we've got to hold it out where they can reach it. And so doing that for the next generation means I have to realize two things about current culture and the way young people and millennials look at Scripture. First off, there is a loss of respect in our culture for the Bible. There is discussions already afoot of whether or not future presidents will have to use the Bible as the book that they will place their hand on. That would have been unthinkable just a couple of decades ago. In our courtrooms now, uh, you know, you see the old movies where you, well, I'd swear on the Bible. Nobody swears on the Bible. Now, of course, as a good member of the church of Christ, I was taught never to swear on the Bible, but that's a whole other theological uh, knot. Uh, 
And so knowing that scriptures not only have lost some respect, and some say, why do you think that's happened? I'm going to give you two, uh, three reasons. A, uh, religious diversity. You know, America's always been a melting pot, but I grew up in a country where Christianity was the assumed leader. We were a Christian nation. I, I, I swallowed that myth fully. And maybe there was a time when some could say, well, Christianity was front and center. Here's, here's one you didn't know. I'm going to bet you didn't know. How many here have ever been to Disneyland? Just raise your hand if you've been to Disneyland. Anybody here on opening day? You'd have to be, okay, were you there on opening day? That's crazy. I, I want a selfie with you. That's awesome. <laughs> Seriously, that's awesome. Were you there on the day that it was dedicated and Walt got up yeah. and spoke? Yeah. Then you may remember, and I've seen the TV footage, <coughs> that after Walt spoke, if I get the order right, Ronnie Reagan, who was doing the play-by-play, -play, said, and now there will be a prayer for Disneyland. And a minister that Walt had selected, I believe he was Presbyterian, stepped up and said, we're thankful for Walt Disney and what he's done, and we want to bless this and ask God to use this place to bless families. He said, will you all please join me? Now, it was a silent prayer. He didn't word a big flowery one, but my 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 jaw was on my chest when I saw that footage. Because the Disney company today probably doesn't have a lot of prayers when they open Shanghai Disney or uh, Disney, uh, Disney World. I'm, not, I'm not, not mashing Disney. I love Disney, man. I'm a big Disneyland fan, and that made me even more. Was Walt a dedicated, devoted? I, I, I can't say that Walt was. Don't really know. But Walt knew this. America was. And so when he opened America's theme park, it opened with a prayer in 1955. But we're not in Kansas anymore. Can I get a oh yeah? We live in a culture in which there is such loss of respect for Scripture that people are wide-eyed and shocked when intelligent folks say they actually believe the Bible. Second, we live in a time when scientific research brings into question some of the simple historicity of the Old Testament. Now, I am now going to walk out onto some really thin ice, but I do that in a place that I know many of you, and I believe we can talk together about things that I'm puzzled about. So, to cover my basis, I said earlier, I believe that the Old Testament is inspired. I want to say it again. I remember the preacher who used to say, I believe in the Bible. I believe in the Bible from the book of Genesis through the maps in the back. It's all inspired by God. And in part, I would join him in that. But a simplistic reading of the Old Testament, a reading of the Old Testament devoid of the study of the background, of the, of the way that history was told in those days, a reading of the Old Testament through the eyes of a typical Westerner, who expects certain kinds of historicity in stories, who expects a certain kind of play-by-play, -play, front of the newspaper. You realize that the Scripture has a number of genres in it, a number of types of literature. And the first chapter of the book of Genesis is highly poetic. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you heard it in Hebrew, you would hear rhythms too in the evening and the morning were the first Day. Now, why are those rhythms there? Remember that this is being orally shared in all probability before it is written down. Why would I think that? When we want to teach our children something we want them to remember before they can read, do you know how we do it? Songs, poems, even us. In 1492, yeah, that is a mnemonic device. I believe that there was a great deal of mnemonic use for the first chapter of the book of Genesis. But when a new atheist steps up and says, oh, this is your book? Hand me your book. Really? Take a look at this. Light is created on this day, and the sun, moon, and stars are created on this day. Really? You guys really want us to believe that? And so they challenge a notion that we really never should have had anyway. 
that the, uh, the first chapter of Genesis should be divvied up scientifically by us, saying in our Western world, when, when, I, when I sit down with a rabbi, when I sit down with somebody who is steeped in the Old Testament, or even it wasn't a great Old Testament prophecy, I love Tim Willits, he's my go-to, and he helped me with this. And I believe it was Tim that said, Jeff, I want you to take a look at the six days. Light, day and night. And then, what did he do next? Divided the waters above from the waters below. So we had sky and sea. And then the third day brought land out of the water. And so land and grass. What happens the next three days? Each of these domains are populated where the sun, moon, and the stars live in day and night. Where do the fish and the fowls live in the rivers, the oceans, and the sky? And what about animals and people? He said, I believe one of the things that story is there to tell us is God plans and provides, and creation was not haphazard. There were no rocks rolling downhill that hit such and such as in some Roman or, or Greek stories of creation or lightning bolts, but a God who carefully prepared a place for everything and every one. Wow. And I thought he put that there so that I could beat up anybody who took, thought it took more than six days to make the world. Now, you say, Jeff, are you a young earth creationist, old earth creationist? Well, here's my challenge. I'm, I'm, I'm not a science guy, but I know and, and really respect some good science guys and gals who would say, I, I don't think that's what that's designed to do. Our class is not going to be about how you interpret the first chapter of Genesis. That's between you and God. Here's what I need you to know. That a simple flat, that's what it says, kind of response to it is driving our kids to a scary choice, to a false binary. It is putting them in a position where the freshman comes home after one, uh, half a semester. It's Thanksgiving. I always pray for our kids here and they leave at Thanksgiving, the freshmen, when they go home to their Christian families. Hey, well, what, what Bible class are you taking, Grandpa asks? Well, um, we're doing oh, Old Testament. Oh, man, yeah. What have you learned? Well, and now the freshman has three choices. One, he can say, well, actually, Grandpa, I learned that uh, the first chapter may well be poetic. And uh, that it, you know, the first three days and second three days, and in the end, it's not really kind of as, as literal as we thought. And Grandpa says, What? <laughs> And Thanksgiving meal has already started heading downhill, right? Now, wait a minute, you're not telling me that the freshman has a second option. The freshman can simply say, oh, we're learning a lot. We're, we're, learning, we're learning a lot. Because he or she thinks, this is not even a safe place for me to talk about this. Now, that is the scary one. Mom, dad, grandpa, grandma. Do things like this come out of your mouth? I know they've come out of mine. Well, land sakes, don't you know better than that? Good night. Didn't you go to VBS? I mean, look, here, here, let me, honey, you got the flannel graph. Bring them out here. We'll show you how this is. It's simple, boy. And when they ask about Noah and they ask about the brutality of killing them all, or when they ask about the Canaanite slaughter, you mean, well, yeah, they had to kill them all. God told them to kill them all. So, Grandpa, did they kill the babies? I mean, in, you know, Jericho, Ai, you know. Yeah, oh, the Bible says they even had to kill the donkeys. Grandpa, what is a pagan donkey? I mean, I'm just curious how they would spread that pagan religion because that's kind of what I always heard is God was kind of wiping it clean. So they killed the donkeys. Anybody uncomfy yet? When I began to listen to these students and when I began to read and when I began to think, man, oh man, 
I taught, I breezed through all that stuff, saying Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, like Gad, Asher, Isaac, Jebel, and Joseph, and didn't think much about the people who were already in the lands that Israel was going into and wiping out. So, I put on my marble costume. Mine is Bible Defender. I imagine it with gold letters somewhere on it and a black leather suit. And I jump in and I say, no, 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 no. It's just because you haven't really read it right. You just need to, you just need to read, you just need to think, you just need to, and I find myself defending some stories I really don't know how to defend. And by the way, I was never called on to defend God. God's plenty big enough to defend himself. But I believe that our Father would like us to consider how we introduce him to the world. Well, you say, well, how can you, what, what can you do? Are you saying we throw the Old Testament out? No, 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 no. But I'm wondering if somebody, and by the way, I thought God did that. I mean, you know, the, the, the binding and the order and everything. That didn't happen until nearly 300 years into the story of Christianity. For 300 years, there was no ta biblia. And when they put it together, they decided and I, I'll get the guy's name for you tomorrow because I thought I had it in my notes and I didn't. The guy who actually said, hey, we'll call this part the Old Testament and then call this part the New Testament. And so all of us who got Bibles knew that somewhere right around in here, it was a little more than half, you'd find Matthew. And everything to the left of that was before Jesus and everything to the right of that was after Jesus. There's a lot of before Jesus and if I don't understand, I don't know if I'm going to make it all the way to Matthew because I'll be so muddled and confused. Oh, come on, do these kids know better than that? I'm here to look in the eye and lovingly say they were not raised like you were raised. They have not been exposed to the, to the Bible teaching and to, uh, to, to scriptural understanding that you and I were. And at times, even my own scriptural understanding, I feel like may have been glossing some things, which leads me to number C, uh, or three, under, under multiple reasons for the lack of respect in culture. The internet confronts our teenagers with arguments against the Bible that generations of Christian students were never exposed to so young. Okay, this is a tough one, but go with me on it. When I was a kid, I never went to any other kind of church at all except the one that I was raised in, the Churches of Christ. I was in high school when a buddy of mine, Bob Williamson, a really, really nice guy, I was the best man in his wedding. When Bob invited me to come help at his VBS, now Bob had come and helped at my VBS because I said, Bob, hey, we need somebody, you know, and can you help us, you know, the puppet stage, setting it up and all that stuff. And Bob was great. And I was thinking, whoa, man, we're going to get Bob, you know, because he went to Christ the King Lutheran Church. I had no idea what was behind the doors of Christ the King Lutheran Church, except not the church. I knew that much. And so when Bob said to me, hey, listen, our VBS is next week. Would you be willing to come and help? Uh, let me ask my mom and dad. And so I said, hey, what, what about this? And dad said, what do you mean, what about this? Now, I, I believe I was in my first year of high school. He said, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not comfortable with that. And, and quite frankly, before I'd even talked to him, I wasn't comfortable with it. Unless I was going to go in and straighten him out, which I did have visions of, right? Right? Kind of a subversive VBS mole in there and saying, so you've been baptized? As a baby? No way. Let me show you. I'm telling you, that was my heart. You say, well, Jeff, why would that have been the first time you'd ever been exposed to a Lutheran church? Because there was no internet. Today, our kids can hear any church, any presenter, any time. They can learn about a plethora of Christian groups. Okay, 
but I need you to know whose ads are right underneath the ones for Francis Chan. Sam Harris. Now, you may not know Sam Harris's name, but if I was a betting man, I'd bet you money that your millennials at your church do. Sam Harris is a brilliant atheist, and he does podcasts and YouTubes that will just flip your head. Richard Dawkins, he's even better got this English accent, you know, and, and these guys sound so erudite and sound so academic. You say, well, Jeff, it's America. They have the right to those things. Of course they do. But they're hitting the sixth graders and the fifth graders who would, at a different time, moms and dads would have said, we're not going to expose you to that. Now, I'm not defending my parents' choice to never let me look inside a Baptist church or a Lutheran church. But I do want to ask you to think through, is there a loss of a kind of innocence and a new worldview that takes place when from very young you've got a screen in front of you in which you can be confronted with, how about the problem of evil? There's one that'll keep us up at night. Can I get a, oh yeah? How about why when bad things happen to good people? There are some of those philosophic and ethical discussions that I was not prepared for at seven, eight, or nine that our kids are having thrust right onto the phones at the end of their arms. And so I listened to some of them. And guess where I found they loved to camp out? In a broken covenant. They loved to talk about slavery and how God seems to love slavery. And they love to talk about Noah and the Canaanites. And they love to talk about genocide and about women's rights. I found it shocking how little they attacked this half of the book. In fact, they almost never went after Jesus. Now, at this point, I struggle to say, what do we do about that? Let me give you a second challenge. The loss of respect in culture for the Bible is matched with a lack of biblical literacy and the rise of an unchurched generation. Today, many young people are not reading it, and even churchgoers are not reading it and studying it as they did. And thanks to digital versions, here's my 60-second rant about not using one of these. In fact, I don't even have, I'm kind of embarrassed, I don't have my cell phone with me. Does anybody, probably nobody here has a cell phone. Uh, <laughs> thanks, bro. Cute pick. Ooh, who is that? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be. Um, we all know that our identity is curated by this item at the end of my arm. And we all know that you can get 62 versions of the Bible without spending 620 bucks or $62,000 to get all the ones you'd like to have, all right here. And it's just a digital flip away. But the problem is when somebody says, turn to, we still say that, don't we? Turn to Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse, and okay, boom, 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 and a verse pops up. They have no clue where it is because of the way we talk about the Bible. And so when all of a sudden they see a verse in Jeremiah that says something wonderful like this, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. They go, that's so cool. And if you go to Mardell's or Hobby Lobby, you can buy a big blow up of that verse, beautifully calligraphied. And they put it up on their wall and somebody says, what is that? The Bible told me that. I'm going to be prospered. Really? And we wonder where the prosperity gospel came from. Because Jesus never said, you guys are going to be rich. He actually said, the world's going to hate you. And he said, you're going to be persecuted. But Jeremiah told, not me, not you, but Israel of his day, there's hope. Oh, by the way, read the rest of it. Seventy years later is when you're going to get it. So if you're going to give it to a college grad, make a note, 70 years from now, it'll be great. <laughs> because that wasn't a promise given to you, and it wasn't a promise given to me. It is an old covenant 
promise. You say, but Jeff, aren't there promises in the Old Covenant that we can hang on to? I believe there are. In fact, I'd suggest that what we find once we get past the Abrahamic promise is we get into promises that are made strongly to a nation. That's Israel. And you don't meet in the Old Testament as much as I thought you did until I put on some different glasses, God the Father as much as God the Founder. I'm stealing that line from a good preacher, Andy Stanley, and, and I, I heard him say it, and I, I puzzled over that. People say the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament. No, and yes, the God of the Old Testament is doing nation building. It's tough work, and he wades into the blood and the mess, and he wades into the culture, and he creates Israel out of nothing. It is nothing short of astounding what Yahweh did with Israel, our God. But understand that the God that you see painted and pictured there was doing the dirty work. I mean, oh, Jeff, that makes me feel uncomfortable. Folks, I'm not sure what else to do when a student says to me, okay, Jeff, I want to be a Christian, but what, what about all this part? You ready for Hebrews now? Hebrews chapter 8. The Hebrew writer, we have to call him or her that because they deigned not to have their name known. The Hebrew writer addresses some of the tensions that was going on in the early church. We'll talk clearly tomorrow, uh, about the um, Jerusalem Council. But I want you to go to, to Hebrews chapter 8, where the Hebrew writer is going to contrast and compare and say one of these things is not like the other between the Old Testament and the New. Now, when I say Old Testament, I know you're thinking about the Bible. I, I want you to think covenant, okay? The Old Covenant, the Ten Commandments, the you do this and I'll do this that God did and blessings and curses that we find in, De in Deuteronomy and that are the foundation and the fabric of everything that comes after let my people go and you're a new nation. Now that's the fabric they lived in. Blessings, curses, the covenant with God. And God warned them and the prophets warned them. If you don't do what you're supposed to do, then you're not going to get what you think you're going to get. And I'll say tomorrow that there are times when we have reached back and took that vision of the world and dumped it on Jesus who never asked for it. That's why legalism and earning my salvation feels so Natural, because when I grab an Old Testament concept and I stick it onto my new Lord, who, by the way, said, um, I have a new command. What do you mean, Jesus? He was already flipping tables and already saying, hey, look, you have heard it said, love your, uh, love your friends and hate your enemies, but I tell you, you have heard it said, but I tell you. And that's pretty, that's pretty authoritative for him to look at the, the Torah, to look at the old covenant and say, yeah, this is yours. You say, uh, Jeff, I, I, I don't know if that's fair. You telling me that's not, well, let's just let the Hebrew writer tackle it. Here we go. I'm going to pick up in verse... Um, I pick up in verse 3. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, but there are already priests who offer gifts prescribed by what? The law. Verse 4. They serve as a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it you make everything according to the pattern. Wow. The pattern. Anybody ever heard of that in church discussions? The pattern. Guess where that came from? That's a reach back and grab an Old Testament Lego and stick it on a New Testament concept. And we've been arguing and fussing about that for years, but just keep going. He says, be sure and, and make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But in fact, the ministry, but in fact, the ministry, can you say it with me? But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs, his priesthood to theirs, 
as the covenant, old or new? Everybody say new. As the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. Now just let that soak in. That old covenant is busted. Better promises are in our new covenant. And boy, I hope we all can praise God about that. I hope we all can praise God that we're not going to heaven because we do the right sacrifices. We're not going to heaven because we keep the right temple. We're not going to heaven because we do the pattern. We're going to heaven because Christ died for our sins on the cross and we are saved by grace through faith. Now, careful, careful, we want to run out and say, well, you're saying it doesn't matter what we do. No, no, no. It matters what Jesus did and we live in a faith response to what Jesus did. But if you think there's an SAT score that's waiting for you in heaven that says, oh man, you got just two points over, you're in. And I'm so sorry. Yeah, you missed those Wednesday nights, remember? Early on? Yeah, sorry. You're, you're, you're out. Uh, we giggle, but, but there's, there's a part of me that says, oh, I live so long that way. And you know what I hadn't realized? I blamed it on the legalism of the church. We've done this for years. Grabbed an Old Testament Lego and popped it onto a New Testament Savior. Oh, there, there's, there's more to come. Let's, let's keep going. <clears throat> Since the new covenant is established on better promises, here's the sentence that ought to blow us out of our chairs, but we're so used to it. For if there had been nothing, come on, with the, okay, wait, 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 okay, did the part of the Bible just tell me that another part of the Bible was wrong? Maybe they're wrong, right? And the Old Testament was right. Praise God, Jesus was right, amen? Jesus is the Savior, Jesus is the Lord, Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. And the Hebrew writer says, if there'd been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no one would have sought for another. But God found fault with the people and and said, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel, with the people of Judah. It'll not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand out of Egypt. He says, listen, God was already in the Old Testament projecting that this was going to happen, that there would be a day that would come. We've got to skip ahead for time down to um, verse uh, 13. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one. Maybe we need to start calling them the obsolete covenant and the new covenant. Now, that'd, that'd give Grandma a chill, but according to the Hebrew writer... He's made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Wow. Sounds almost like Jesus when he said, I have come not to abolish the old covenant. By that I mean just do it away. I've come to fulfill it. The word fulfill there can be translated as in closed or completed. It's like a plane that lands. The flight has landed, right? Jesus landed the plane of the old covenant. He fulfilled it. He nailed it to the cross. He completely completed it. He made it obsolete. How obsolete? How outdated? Well, he predicted the fact, I believe, that the temple would be destroyed. Because once you destroy the temple, how are you going to fulfill all those temple commandments? Jesus was the final sacrifice, praise God, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And while it's pretty easy for us to go, well, yeah, of course the animal sacrifices are over, tomorrow we will listen to some of the harshest words Paul uses in the entire canon of his letters in the New Testament. When Paul says, "Um, there's some of you at Galatia who think you can go back and take an Old Testament Lego and put it on the New Testament and are trying to finish by the Spirit, uh, finish in the flesh what was begun in the Spirit because you want to make them be circumcised. Well, guys, let me put it this way. 
And what he says next is never talked about in VBS. <laughs> and if you're going, I don't remember that, I'm not going to tell you till tomorrow. I'm going to make you hunt it up. And when you're due, you'll say, oh, that's sake, has that always been in there? Yeah, it has. Just like Dinah and the Shechemites, we kind of skipped that story on the flannel graphs. So, what have we said? I'm asking a question not about, is the Old Testament God's Word? No, no, it is God's Word. But I'm asking a question about how we view it, teach it, and how we introduce people to a new covenant. I wonder, I wonder if I can begin by calling it what our speaker called it this morning in the field house, the Hebrew Scriptures. That's the Hebrew Scriptures. They're there for our learning. They're there for us to read and, and understand and hear these stories, some of them stories that are puzzling and difficult. But it's the Hebrew Scriptures. The Christian Scriptures are those that tell the story of Jesus. But isn't Jesus in the Old Testament? Oh, surely, absolutely. In fact, Jesus has been found all kinds of places in the Old Testament that I'm not even sure if the writers had any clue that they, that they were talking about. Because when you're looking for something, you'll often find what you're looking for. Just uh, when you drive around today, look for red cars. And you'll say, man, I can't believe how many red cars I saw. It's because you're looking for them. As Christians, we look for Jesus everywhere, and so did the early uh, you know, church fathers. But just because I see a prophecy about Christ there, I cannot reach back and grab concepts of do this and God will give you this. Or be bound to saying, I've got to defend every page here and say, yeah, 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 that's really okay. Actually, some things happen in the Old Testament that aren't okay. And when the same David that killed Goliath in battle, okay, that's kind of fair, you know, writes, oh, I want to smash the heads of my enemies babies on a rock. It's in the Psalms. So how do we help a generation that's brand new? Tomorrow we're going to talk and just kind of ponder together about introducing them to the greatest figure in all of history, maybe even first. What about the backstory? We'll get his backstory. But here's, if I've only got five minutes with you, if I've only got 60 seconds with you, here's what you need to know. God so loved the world that he gave his son, Jesus, who came to the earth fully God, fully man, and showed us how to be fully human and told us he had a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. This generation is dying to hear that message. Let us not let the stories in the Old Testament get in the way of them getting there. And there, we'll continue tomorrow. Bow your head. Father, uh, thank you for letting us be challenged. God, I, I thank you for challenging me, but Lord, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still wrestling. And so first, I just need to confess ignorance. And I confess there are questions that I can't answer. There are difficult scientific puzzles I can't puzzle out. But, oh, Lord, thank you that I don't have to do that to be saved. Thank you that my salvation is in Jesus Christ. Thank you that I am not measured by some Old Testament law. Thank you that my goodness is not put on a scale. Thank you that my sacrifices are not weighed. Thank you that instead it was the weight of Jesus on the cross that bought me heaven and everybody else who would choose it. Thank you for Jesus. May we focus on him. May we lean into him. And may we show that, yes, there's a broken covenant with which, well, things were wrong. God, we know the things that were wrong was us. We couldn't keep that covenant, no way, no how. But Father, I believe you knew that and you were preparing us. You were building a nation and building a path and bringing the Messiah, who when he came, nailed it to the cross with his own body and then opened the way to a new covenant that this world is dying to receive. May we live it out, I pray, with the Spirit's power. And in Jesus' name we all say, 
Amen. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow at 2.